is the legend of the spectacular Rocky Mountain ghost town of Chattanooga, Colorado. Howdy there, I'm Zane Lewis, and today I'll be telling you the story of one of the most prominent ghost towns along the Million Dollar Highway called Chattanooga in the San Juan Mountain Range of the Rocky Mountains. It was once an important mining camp near the Silver Ledge Mine and a supply stop along the Silverton Railroad. While today not much remains, it leaves a legacy of having once been an important part of many people's lives, and today you can still see its remains, raw, untamed, rugged, and beautiful. How was this town founded? What hardships did its residents suffer through? And what led to its demise? Well, we don't have all the answers, but using the important information that we have, we'll rediscover the story of one of my favorite legends of Colorado. The story of Chattanooga first began in 1882, when a camp called Sweetville was created at the head of Mineral Creek and below Red Mountain Pass. The first establishment at the town was E.T. Sweet Saloon, and before long, more businesses such as a lumberyard, a restaurant, and a butcher shop sprang up. Just a little while after Sweetville was founded, a competitor was built right next to it, being named Chattanooga, which was named by soon-to-be postmaster Frank Carroll for his hometown in Tennessee. In 1883, the towns merged under Chattanooga's name, and Carroll became the first postmaster of the town. The town would become a part of the Red Mountain Mining District, one of the richest mining districts in the entire United States. The place absolutely boomed, Due to the inception of the Silver Crown Mine, along with new businesses such as a hardware store, the Enterprise Restaurant, and two mercantiles getting set up. By the end of the year, an astonishing 75 buildings had been constructed. Around that time, an ore vein was discovered just a little outside of the town, which would become the Silver Ledge Mine, one of the most important mines in the district. However, nothing would be done with this vein until seven years later, in 1890. Also in that same year, George W. Seaman was awarded a contract by the San Juan County Commission to begin grading a seven mile long wagon road from Chattanooga to the silver rich town of Silverton, one of the most famous mining towns in Colorado. The road was constructed in order for the county to secure a role as a gateway community over its rival, the Switzerland of America, Ure, Colorado. Chattanooga was situated at a lower elevation than many other mines and camps in the Red Mountain Mining District, and as a result, it became an important supply stop. Wagons would arrive from Silverton and transfer supplies to the pack trains that would haul those supplies to the many mines in the area. During the winter time, sleds would be used to haul the many necessities that people needed. In July of 1887, Otto Mears, the pathfinder of the San Juans, began building the Silverton Railroad to reach the various mining camps of the Red Mountain Mining District, and it would reach Chattanooga later that year. Mears would construct a famous loop above the town, a 200 degree curve that climbed over 500 feet within just one one-fourth miles. In order to construct the loop around the small camp, Mears hired Charles W. Gibbs, who was known for having excellent solutions to difficult problems and had many years of experience under his belt. Together they successfully built not only the Silverton Railroad, but also the famed Rio Grande Southern. When the line was finished in September of 1889, it spanned a total length of about 15 miles from Silverton to the important San Juan mining camp of Ironton. It crossed some of the most difficult and unforgiving terrain in Colorado and would become known as the Rainbow Route. At its highest peak, Chattanooga had over 300 residents, along with numerous different establishments such as grocery stores, saloons, boarding houses, restaurants, among many others. But mining within the immediate area began to diminish, and with the arrival of the Silverton Railroad, the town was no longer as vital of a supply stop as it once was, and its population decreased. While the town was more dependent on traffic from the higher elevation mines and towns in the Red Mountain Mining District more than ever, it was still able to survive the economic downturn of the late 1880s. In 1890, the area's residents saw a brief glimmer of hope, believing that multiple mines around the area would help revive the town, 
as gold had been discovered in the area, and hundreds of miners began to stake many different claims, giving Chattanooga a much needed boost during the silver panic of the early 1890s. Two of the most promising mines were the Boner Mine, laying towards the south, and the Silver Ledge Mine, laying towards the north. The original vein for the Silver Ledge had been discovered in 1883, however nothing was done with it until 1890 when a man named J.C. Kingsley dug a shaft in search of the rich ore there. Disaster struck when a fire broke out in the shaft house later that year, with the miners still working below. None of them were alerted to the flames until a signal bell cord fell into the shaft, after having been completely burnt from the bell, followed by an ore bucket. Forced back into the shaft by the crispy death away them, the miners were saved when a box full of dynamite exploded and scattered burning debris, allowing them to survive without suffocating. Just a year after this catastrophe, Kingsley leased the mine to a British syndicate, which bought out the property, however defaulted on its payments, allowing a man named William Feigl to buy it at bankruptcy auction. Feigl was able to successfully manage the mine and begin hauling out its riches. Unfortunately, for the small, beleaguered legend of Colorado, known as Chattanooga, these developments weren't enough. In 1892, a fire destroyed most of the town, and the burnt buildings were never rebuilt, and with the repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act in 1893, the mines in the area took a big blow as the value of silver decreased, and traffic through the town went down as well. The post office shut down a year later, in 1894. Nevertheless, even with a dwindling flow of money coming through the area, Chattanooga and the few businesses that remained continued to serve as a stop along the Silverton Railroad, while miners still occupied the cabins at the place, with the Silver Ledge helping to keep the place alive. In 1897, the mine was purchased by a group of Denver elites who decided to create the Silver Ledge Mining Company and to build a mill at the site of the mining operation. The mill was completed later that year, and the miners discovered some rich ore, even striking a gold vein. Both the mine and mill went into full production, and their success lasted into 1899. Unfortunately, due to the company overspending, and the mill being unable to recover enough metals from the ores it was receiving, the company was forced to suspend operations during the winter of 1899 and enter bankruptcy. Also in that same year, due to having gone bankrupt in the prior year, Otto Mears' Silverton Railroad went into receivership as the vital mining traffic along the line continued continued to decrease. Thanks to Warner's efforts, 1900 would be a major turnaround in the mine's history as more workers were hired to run the mill and eastern investors began to provide money to assist with buying and setting up new mill equipment along with other improvements on the property. At that time, 55 people still lived at the nearby Chattanooga with the town surviving in part thanks to the mine. Tragedy struck the mine once again when fire ravaged the entire surface plant including the mill and shaft house. The owners rebuilt the surface plant and shaft house, however decided to rebuild the mill at Chattanooga rather than at its original site. It was put into production in 1902, helping to boost the town's economy. But, during his tenure as manager, Warner had taken on more debt than he could repay, causing the Bank of Silverton to confiscate the property. He was able to come to an agreement with the bank to produce as much as possible with the mine and mill, and use the money to repay his creditors. Sadly, the new mill was only minorly better than the previous one, and the operation ceased in 1903, terminating with Warner losing his position. After this, the San Juan Mining and Leasing Company leased the Silver Ledge. The company's metallurgists observed the increasing demand for zinc and invented new concentration equipment to assist with meeting the demand. One of his inventions was an electric separator that used a magnetic field to force zinc and iron particles out of pulverized ore. In 1904, the mill at Chattanooga was refitted to be able to both recover the zinc from the mine's ores, as well as condition it so that the rest of the metals could be extracted. Thanks to the efforts of the company, the Silver Ledge became the first operation to produce meaningful amounts of zinc in all of San Juan County. Also in that same year, a new post office called the Silver Ledge was opened, and the Silverton Railroad's assets were sold under foreclosure, and the line ceased to exist. 
However, it would soon get reorganized as the Silverton Railway and was reopened in 1906 and thanks to a new mining operation called the Joker Tunnel, the railway became profitable once again. During this time, the mine mainly produced low-grade galena, which is the main type of lead. The ore oftentimes contains other minerals such as silver, zinc, arsenic, and cadmium. Thanks to the efforts of the miners, the Silver Ledge became the first mine in the country to recover marketable amounts of zinc, producing about 30 tons of concentrates a day, which helped draw attention to the small and rugged town next to it. In 1905, the San Juan Mining and Leasing Company ceased production at the Silver Ledge. Even to this day, the reasons as to why they did this are still unknown. Nevertheless, two men named D.E. Carmichael and Jesse Kramer took over the lease and continued heavy production using the zinc ore separators. However, just a little while after taking over, in the fall, they were prevented from continuing the operation due to litigations over unpaid debts. As a result, many workers were laid off, with the mine keeping only enough to extract low-grade ore and treat it in the mill. In 1906, the Silver Ledge shut down, as the miners believed they had extracted everything profitable, and the post office at Chattanooga also closed its doors, and the town was likely completely abandoned that same year, with the U.S. Census Bureau reporting not a single soul living there in 1910. And with that, Chattanooga, once one of the most beautiful and important towns in the rich Red Mountain Mining District, vanished into the abyss of history. As for the Silverton Railway, James Pitcher, Otto Mears' son-in-law, took over its operations in 1911 after Mears retired at the ripe age of 71 years old, having lived a very successful life. While passenger operations were cut back to Red Mountain Town in 1912, World War I revived the area's once legendary mines, however the railroad ran being controlled by the federal government. As soon as the war ended, the line was barely needed anymore, with only 49 trips being made over it at the height of the Spanish flu in 1919. Just two years later, with not a single train rolling across the line anymore, the owners of the line filed a petition to abandon it. In 1922, the petition was granted, and the railway's equipment was moved to the Silverton Northern Railroad, another one of Mears' old railroads. The right-of-way was given up to both the San Juan County and Colorado State Highway Departments, with the rails being torn up in 1926. During the Second World War, a man named Joseph Bradley bought the Silver Ledge Mine, attempting to bring it back into operation for the first time in years to help supply America with much needed ores during the war years. However, he became mainly focused on the Highland Mary Mine, located just a little bit outside of Silverton, and for the most part ignored the Silver Ledge. In 1947, he leased it to its former leasers, the San Juan Mining and Milling Company. Using core drills, the company prospected towards the north of the property and discovered ore. Along the west side of the vein, the miners discovered a new formation that was close enough to the surface for them to be able to use heavy equipment to extract the ore rather than pay more by mining underground. Throughout the next few years, the company used bulldozers along with a power shovel to extract the ore and hauled it off by truck to the Mayflower Mill in Silverton and the American Zinc Mill at Ure. Despite the newfound success, the operation ended circa 1952 and the Silver Ledge Mine became one of many abandoned legends of Colorado. So, what remains of these three phenomenal legends of Colorado today? Well, for starters, the ghost town of Chattanooga can be found about 7 miles from Silverton, along the Million Dollar Highway, which was constructed over much of Otto Mears' Silverton Railroad, along with his toll roads. At the town, there are a few structures scattered throughout the town site, such as this mining structure with multiple ore chutes, which is in the same spot as the old Silver Ledge Mill, leading me to believe that it was once a part of that mill. It is surrounded by some beautiful scenery, and thanks to the amazing photos I've taken of it, has become one of my all-time favorite abandoned structures. The Silver Ledge Mine sits about two miles away, and has been decently well-preserved, 
with a head frame and multiple other structures still in existence. In 2010, multiple groups launched an effort to remove toxic mine waste from the mine as it had been leaking into Mineral Creek and flowing into the Animus River. The head frame was also stabilized and shored up on more sure ground. As for the Silverton Railroad, much of the million dollar highway runs over its former right of way. However, various remnants of the line still exist, such as the Corkscrew Gulch Turntable, a rebuilt depot at the ghost town of Guston, and remains of track along easy to spot railroad grade. Many remnants of other mining camps and railroads still exist in the same area, and each one has become an equally important important legend of Colorado, helping to supply the world with vital minerals and ores that couldn't be obtained anywhere else. Altogether, they made the San Juan Mountains one of the richest mountain ranges in all of North America, beautifully crafting the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people. The legacy of the miners and ordinary townspeople who once inhabited the area can still be felt today by just admiring the red and yellow dirt in the mountains that was left over from the mines, or by just seeing the adits, mills, and other structures that these American pioneers once built. And that, my friends, is a legacy that will last for years into the future. Yeah, the miners and settlers who built Chattanooga and crafted the surrounding area left quite a legacy, didn't they? They crossed some of the most unforgiving terrain in the West, building mines, railroads, and towns, all thought to be impossible to build in such a hostile environment. They built these things in order to secure a better life for themselves and their families. Many of our most important towns and highways were originally just mining camps or railroad stops. Mining offered a way to strike it rich and live the dream life seeing the world, and today, you can still see the world that they created. Raw, untamed, rugged, and beautiful. I'm Zane Lewis. Thanks for watching. <laughs>